I really wish I lived in the world of Psalm 1. It's so simple, isn't it? So orderly, so predictable. It says, those who delight in the law of the Lord are like trees planted by streams of water. In all they do, they prosper. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. The Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked shall perish. Isn't that nice? Go this way and everything will just turn out great for you. Go that way and you'll wind up cast into the outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. Anybody with one eye and half sense would choose this way, right? Life's choices are simple in the world of Psalm 1. But I don't live in that world. And neither do you. And neither does anybody else. Not even the writers of the Psalms lived in that world. Lots of other psalms deal with life's ambiguities, but Psalm 1 paints with this large canvas on a broad brush, and nobody lives there all the time. The movie Passengers doesn't live there either. The consequences of questionable choices are at the heart of this film. If you haven't seen it, here's the setup. The starship Avalon is transporting 5,000 passengers and 258 crew members to a distant planet where they will establish a new colony. But the journey takes 120 years. And so all the colonists and crew are in hibernation pods. 30 years into the trip, the ship passes through a meteor storm which causes a malfunction which awakens one passenger 90 years too early. Jim Preston, played by Chris Pratt. Unable to return to hibernation, Jim wanders around the ship for a year, becoming more and more lonely, more and more despondent, more and more suicidal. The pain of his isolation is palpable, and you can't help wondering what you yourself would do if you knew that you were going to spend the rest of your life without another single human being anywhere. Reminds me of the very first episode of The Twilight Zone. Maybe you remember this one. It's about a man named Mike Ferris who finds himself in a town that looks deserted, but everywhere he goes, he seems to find proof that someone was just there recently. Food's cooking on a stove. Water is dripping in a sink. A cigar is burning in an ashtray. Ferris grows more and more unsettled as he wanders through this empty town looking for someone, anyone to talk to. He goes into a movie theater and the movie starts to play. But when he runs up to the projection booth, it's empty too. As he descends further and further into madness, it's revealed that Ferris is actually an astronaut in training who has been confined to an isolation room for 484 hours and 36 minutes, hallucinating that whole time to determine his psychological fitness for a prolonged, lonely space flight. Jim Preston is not in an isolation room. He is literally living Mike Ferris's nightmare. And then one day he notices Aurora Lane, played by Jennifer Lawrence, sleeping in her hibernation pod. Well, after finding out all he can about her from her video profile, he entertains the thought of reviving her, and he agonizes over that decision. He knows it's wrong. He knows it isn't right to rob Aurora of her planned life just because he was robbed of his. But the ship is so big and it's so empty and his days are so lonely. So finally he wakes her up. But he claims that her pod malfunctioned just like his did. Now, what Jim did was utterly selfish and reprehensible, no question about it. And it perfectly illustrates how our choices always rebound on ourselves and on others. And if Psalm 1 applied across the board, 
then passengers would end with Aurora put back in her hibernation pod for the rest of her space flight while Jim is eaten by a horrible alien from the planet Coosbane. But it doesn't go that way. Jim isn't a bad person. In fact, he's obviously a nice guy. He made a bad choice. And for a while in the movie, you think he's going to get away with his deception. Once Aurora begins to accept the reality of her situation, she and Jim become friends, and then they become lovers. And all would have gone swimmingly if the dumb android bartender on board hadn't spilled the beans. Well, understandably, Aurora is devastated and, and enraged when she learns the truth that her pot had not malfunctioned, but that Jim specifically woke her up. She berates him. Jim tries to apologize, but she physically attacks him and then shuns him. And you can't, you really can't fault her. She has every right to be livid and despondent. You know what it's like to be excruciatingly lonely like Jim, and you want to know what it's like to feel utterly betrayed and robbed like Aurora. You know it because that's the kind of world we live in, right? We often find ourselves in terrible situations, either caused by us or caused by someone else, and there's nothing we can do about them. So now, Aurora must make a choice. It isn't the one she wanted, but it's the only choice she's got. She can either live in isolation from Jim on that big, huge spaceship, or she can find a way to forgive him and live in relationship with him. Either one is a painful choice. The late John Claypool said, there isn't a person in this world who can choose whether or not to have pain in this life. It comes with the territory. We will all have pain. Claypool said the only choice we have is what kind of pain we will have. We either choose the pain of isolation, closing ourselves off from others, or we choose the pain of relationship, opening our hearts to others who sometimes treasure our hearts and sometimes break them. That is precisely the choice Aurora is given. She didn't want it, but that's the way it is. Isolation will be painful because it deprives her of the companionship God created us for, and relationship will be painful because it meant forgiving Jim. Jesus told a story about what happens when you choose not to forgive. It was acted out for us today. He told of a slave who owned, who owed the king 10,000 talents. Jim, if we could bring up the next slide. That's an actual Roman talent. And as Mary mentioned earlier, it's worth equal to and sometimes more than 15 years worth of wages for the average laborer. So let's bring that up. One talent, one talent, was worth an exorbitant amount of money. And Jesus said the slave owed 10,000 talents? Oh, come on. It would be like you or me saying, well, he owed him a bazillion dollars. The point is not the amount. The point is the absolute inability of anybody in the ancient world, much less a slave, to pay back such a debt. But the king forgave the debt. He took the loss and demanded absolutely nothing in return. But then that same slave went out and found a fellow slave who owed him a hundred denarii. Let's bring up the next one. That's a Roman denarius. Bring up the next slide. One denarius was equal to a day's labor for the average laborer. So, a hundred denarii is not exactly chump change, but it's not even in the same universe with 10,000 talents or a bazillion dollars. And yet the first slave who had been forgiven so much threw the second slave in jail for non-payment of the debt. And when the king found out what happened, he rescinded his offer. And he had the first slave tossed into jail until he could pay the debt, which meant he would be in jail for the rest of his life 
and then some. Okay, Jim. Lack of forgiveness is a prison. Lack of forgiveness is a prison. It tortures you with bile and bitterness and a sour spirit, and eventually you become that old guy yelling at the neighbor kids to get off your lawn. Or you become that frown-faced aunt that nobody wants to invite to Christmas dinner. When you choose not to forgive, the hurt and the anger wraps those tentacles around you and your soul turns as dark as a thousand moonless nights. And it's no good offering partial forgiveness either. There's no such thing. You either forgive, painful as it is, or you don't forgive. Start importing caveats into it and it's not forgiveness anymore. Reminds me of the couple who adopted a boy literally off the streets who was dressed in rags and his shoes were full of holes and all their friends were worried that this street ruffian was going to be a nightmare at home. But to everyone's surprise, he was incredibly docile. One day a friend was talking to the father and he said, how do you keep that boy's behavior under control so well? And the father said, oh, we just keep his old pair of shoes close by all the time. And whenever he starts acting up, we just bring out those old shoes. And he knows exactly what kind of life he would have without us. So he straightens up pretty quick. How would you like having somebody wave your old shoes at you? Look how much I've done for you. You owe me. Now watch your P's and Q's, buster. That's not forgiveness. That's manipulation. Aurora could have chosen that approach, but it would have been no better than Jim's choice. Both cho choices rob the person of their dreams and their sense of worth. No, forgiveness does not right or wrong. It can't do that. Forgiveness does not peel back time and give you the life that you wanted in the first place. No, what forgiveness does is open a gateway to the best life available to us. I battle with bitterness over what others have done to me, and I wish that I could go back and change it, but I can't. All I can do is forgive and live the best life available to me now. Likewise, I feel incredibly sorry for what I have done to others, and I wish I could go back and change it, but I can't. All I can do is forgive myself and live the best life available to me now. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm just saying, what are your options? Most of you, I'm sure, remember what happened on April, April 19th, 1995. That was the day a bomb exploded in the Alfred P. Murrow Federal Building in Oklahoma City. One of the 168 victims that day was a young woman named Julie, 23-year-old daughter of a man by the name of Bud Welch. From the moment he learned that a bomb had killed his daughter, Bud Welch lived on hate. Like so many others, he wanted a speedy conviction. He wanted a speedy execution, and his anger was focused on those chief conspirators, Timothy McVeigh and Terry Nichols, and he wanted them to suffer like he had suffered. He tried to get on with his life, but his anger just kept boiling to the surface. And then a few months after the, after the bombing, Welch was watching TV one day, and he saw Bill McVeigh, the father of Timothy McVeigh, on TV, and as he listened to Bill McVeigh talk, Bud Welch realized, oh dear God, this man has lost a child too. Not long afterwards, he summoned up all his courage and he visited the site of the Murrow building for the first time since the bombing, and he spotted an elm tree near the place where Julie always parked her car. 
And he was surprised to see it had not only survived the blast, but was actually sprouting new branches. Now you would expect Welch to say that he thought of new life as he saw the new growth on the tree, but that's not the thought that came to him. The thought that came to him was, Timothy McVeigh's execution will not end my pain. So Welch stopped advocating for the death penalty. And people began to notice. All over the country, he, people began inviting him to come to their town, to their city, to their locale, to talk to certain groups about his evolving feelings over this whole matter. And one of those invitations came from Buffalo, New York, where Bill McVeigh lived. And so it was on September 5th, 1998, Bud Welch found himself in Bill McVeigh's home. And he discovered Bill McVeigh to be a blue-collar Joe just like himself. He met Bill's daughter, Jennifer, who reminded Welch of Julie's friends. And Welch said to them both, we can't change the past, but we have a choice about the future. On June 11, 2001, Timothy McVeigh was executed by lethal injection. But long before that day, Bud Welch launched a campaign to save the elm tree outside the Murrah building from the bulldozer. And it stands there today. Not only a memorial to those who died on April 19, 1995, but also as testimony to one man's remarkable journey from hatred to forgiveness. Did Aurora make the same journey? Well, all I know is the movie ends when the ship's crew awakens 88 years later and discovers a small house on the ship's grand concourse with lush vegetation growing all around it. And I'm not sure, but I think I saw an elm tree. 